And we'll pray and begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the prayers of the Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us to save us. Amen. This is a good section. Um, we stopped at Police Code 187. I mean, page 187. Isn't 187 police code for oh, murder? Supposedly. 187 happening. You knew the hypostasis of Christ. And we kind of ended on that anyways, but who would like to summarize one divine person and hypostasis? Did we talk about that word? Um, in ancient Greece, it was known as substance, and like a hypo versus hyper. Does anybody know that medical distinction? Hypo is under. Under. Hyper is over. Stasis, standing under. So. You have this kind of idea that there's different properties of like orange and different stuff, but what stands under all the the kind of properties you can name of it of this thing out here? The substance tree. So you get this kind of notion of essence, substance. Well, the Greek the the Greek word is uh, hypostasis. This then transitions and takes on kind of different a new meaning with the fathers and it begins to emerge as a uh, person so we had christ the vine logos the second person of the holy trinity Or fully God. So here's the person. And so remember, in the person, the hypostasis, you have obviously fully divine and fully human in the incarnation. That's the what we call the hypostatic union. Lost my place. Where is it? One eighty eight. Um, we referred to the Council of Chalcedon definition, not separated. And obviously, this picture is not going to be well because you can't really diagram the hypostatic union, but not separated or divided into two persons. So there's only one person here, always. And there's only one divine person. We sometimes call this the, there's a good term. The personal subject. So if we think in terms of grammar, right? You have subject and predicate. Remember this? Subject, verb, and predicate. Predicate is said of the subject. It's attributed to the subject, correct? So just grammatically, it's what belongs to the subject. It's the container for all the things. So Johnny is five years old. Five years old is said of the subject. Whatever else you want to plug in there. But well, person acts in the same way, personhood. It's not equivalent to nature. Remember all the heresies or confusion of nature and person. 
for Aristotle, and unfortunately for the non-Chalcedonians, Aristotle had no, and philosophy itself never really had ever kind of worked out a coherent notion of personhood. For Aristotle, you have form and matter. Matter is the principle of individuation, Aristotle says. So if I have a form or essence, our essence is human being, right? For Aristotle, you become the particular, the, the individuation, the individual human being by simply this being instantiated in that matter. Almost the way like if you have an idea, which is more like an essence of a table and you form that, you have a blueprint that you form and you're like, now I've instantiated my idea right there. That's kind of this Aristotelian understanding. Does everybody kind of understand that? So what makes you you for Aristotle is the particular way that that's instantiated in the matter. So it's like you have a snub nose, you have this color hair and stuff like that, but it's the way that the form forms the matter. That for him, that particular instantiation is simply what a person is. So it's very reductive. In orthodoxy, person is not reduced. It's not just, well, I've got this idea or essence and I just put it in the matter and that's just what a person is. It transcends nature. So that natures belong to persons. Does that make sense? So persons are much more than an essence or an essence or nature right there. And that's part of the, the mystery of personhood. Because typically in philosophy, you explain everything in terms of what? What things are, essences, laws, nature. But now I have a category that transcends all laws, essences of nature. It has something to do with it, right? You don't find persons without natures. And you certainly don't find human or divine natures apart from persons, but they're not reducible. They're not the same thing. There's a mystery. There's something transcendent about the person. It becomes the subject of which it can embrace and take on, just like Johnny can take on being five years old, right? It's a tribute to the subject. The person, each person is unique because they're not reduced simply to their particular matter or their soul or essence of being a human being, their nature. But this universal human nature belongs to the person. Does that make sense? This is really deep, deep and difficult stuff. But we don't get to stray. We're going to become heretics. So likewise for the divine, persons, whether it's the first father, the second, or the third Holy Spirit, They are the personal subject of the divine nature. And they all have the divine nature equal. It's not like, well, one person gets a little bit more and the other doesn't. So properly speaking, because of that, Christ is a divine person with a divine nature, becomes incarnate for us in our salvation takes on not part of human nature, but all of it. Without changing the personhood, he doesn't become uh, what we call in philosophy a tertia quid, a third thing. It's not a hybrid. It wasn't genetically spliced and become something else. Because he 
is a pronoun, a personal pronoun. What did we say? Natures are what's, persons are who's. That's why we can explain the Trinity, one what and three who's. Kind of cool, huh? One what, three who's. And to explain the hypostatic union of the incarnate, incarnate uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, two what's in one who that does not affect or change the who. He always remains a divine person. This is also the subject, just like in grammar, is the uniting principle which predicates belong. The persons are uniting here with Christ. Um, in the, the example of Christ, uniting the divine and human nature. And this is expressed again in the Council of Chalcedon. They're not separated. So it's not like this. It's not the second person and that would be separated. They're united. And again, this is going to fail me at some point because and again, if we took the Aristotelian conception and this is what happens with the um, the non-Chalcedonians, the Orientals. If all it means to be a person is an individual individuation of an essence right there, and if we say that, well, Christ is right there and he has two natures, then it would end up the two natures would make two persons. So that's why we have to say personhood transcends nature. It's not reducible to it. So that it doesn't make two persons. There's not two persons here when Christ is walking right there. When you say the Orientals, who are you referring to? Those would be the Indian Orthodox, um, the Ethiopian, Armenians, um, and Etrians, uh, and the Coptic. So they're not in communion with. They use the term Orthodox. We shouldn't really call them Orthodox. Ethiopians are Orthodox. No, I mean they use the term, but they're. Technically, and I don't mean this in a derogatory term, they're heretics. Now, they're probably the closest to us, but they are not allowed to commune that or receive good. any of the um, sacraments. And one of the problems is, even if we could get past, the, oh, we're really speaking the same language. I mean, we're really, it's a language problem. We're really talking about the same thing. Even if I could get to that, and I'm not convinced at all, because I've argued with enough Orientals to know that I'm like, it's not a, it's not simply a language difference. Like, they have a real different conception. Exactly what I said here. Why they're going to say one nature. It's not a language issue at all. Um, but as Bishop Maxim had brought up, the reason why they're not Orthodox, here's a big problem. They venerate heretics that we've condemned, and they venerate them as saints. Saint Severus. So even if we could get past that, how could they be Orthodox? That's what Bishop Maxim brought up. Like, even if, and it's the same with Rome, too. We, we talked about the Orientals in Rome. Even if you could be like, okay, we agree on the doctrine, we can get over this, we lift anathemas or something like that, we've got a whole other problem. means you have to get rid of all uh, tons of saints of yours because they're condemned as heretics. 
Orientals, they would actually have to be like, we made a mistake, they're actually heretic. That's what they have to say, too. Yeah. All right, so and Saint Severus of Antioch was the one I'm referring with the Orientals, yeah. So if the non-Orthodox, the Orientals believe there's Jesus had two natures, they they say it this way: the Orientals believe this. What does that mean, though? What? How is that different? What? You know, I, I they explain. believe this from two natures. From two natures. one nature, one person. Because they already have a conception that if you have natures, two natures in a person, then you have two persons. That's why they have that reductive. So what do they say? Christ from two natures makes one nature. That's what we call mono- when they say two natures, do they mean a divine and a human nature? Like a God and a human nature? Yeah, that's... So they're saying there's no longer two natures. Two, one plus one equals one. You put two together and you get one. You get one nature. That's what they believe. That's why it's called mono. Husus means nature. And if you talk with enough of them and argue with, you'll figure out, because it, it could seem like it's just, oh, maybe we're just talking past each other. Maybe it's just a language thing. But then I was able to realize, I'm like, no, nope, they have a particular understanding of what constitutes personhood. And it's incorrect. And one of the reasons why that they fall into this, it's somebody that's so locked to antiquity, antiquarians, that's the, excuse me, the word I was looking for. They're so locked into, like, we can't change, the words can never change, right? That's innovation, right? They want to, out of, you know, a good intention, stay traditional to the words. But the problem is, as we saw with hypostasis, that word evolved. Words evolve. The fathers allow flexibility of words because sometimes you have to address new heresies and new things that come up. Words should be fluid. Concepts and dogma and doctrine not. And so they were so worried, they were so stuck to an, not changing the words that they, when these new debates came up, they ended up making a conclusion that was erroneous and heretical because they wouldn't abandon the early Cyrillian language, the Earl, uh, early St. Cyril. So two issues. They have an incorrect notion of personhood, what constitutes a person. And two, they won't allow flexibility of language to evolve. And third problem with the Orientals, why they're not Orthodox, they reject all the rest of the councils because they're non-Chalcedonians. Fifth, sixth, and seventh, which was, there's amazing, they have, no coherent or if any at all doctrine of the divine energies, which later gets explicated, right? And, re and refined and talked about. No Palamite theology, right? Which is essentially part of our... So they're very, very close to us, but they're not orthodox. As much as we want. And if they were, why aren't we communing? I mean, if it was literally just a language game, then why aren't we in communion? Why aren't they allowed to, right? Those are my arguments for... Not to open the 
the thoughts of debate and get completely off topic, but there, one plus one equals one. What does that mean? How is that, other than semantics, how is that, what does it change in, in the, the life of Christ and the worship of Christ? And what does it change in everything to make them heretical? Do you mean, why is this even significant? Yeah. Um, well, could it, one thing is it affects other theology and later things. Divine energies, concepts, just like anything that we saw too, Nestorianism, right? Like, we end up talking about a different... I can't understand because I have no idea what you're talking about, but at least now I know. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just like one mistake can cause further mistakes is one. So it might not seem to have any practical, but uh, is Dr. David Bradshaw have brought up too that, but it does affect liturgical and worship too. Because people think this stuff's like, well, this is all just highfalutin philosophy and theology. Like, how does this relate? But then it does. Because we're a whole, all these things affect you. So your worship changes. Um, you might end up throwing out iconography. Like, do you see, like, it all starts to come unravel? So something that just seems kind of abstract and theoretical ends up making a huge difference in very practical things. In architecture, like, because even the architecture and iconography is theological. That's why we can't just do anything we want. And often, like, stuff that we would say rubs us the wrong way, right? That it's iconoclast or the architecture is ugly. Guess what? You can trace it back to a simple theological error of, well, it's because they had this precise. You can roll it back. So they, they do. Like it's, yeah, great, great question. Um, and the same error can play out in different ways. Have you noticed that? Like think about if a child's brought up under vice of a parent or abuse or something like that with the siblings that can all affect them in different ways. They can go and become different bad things. Yeah. It's not like the same mistake of the parent will play out the same way. Heresy is like that too. A small mistake in the beginning becomes a big mistake later, and it can play out in different ways. Maybe you're an historian. Maybe you end up becoming a monophysite. Maybe you end up becoming um, an adoptionist. Maybe you end up becoming a Gnostic. They all come back to the one mistake. Confusion between nature and person. And it can play out a lot of different ways. And then once that plays out, one heresy leads to another heresy leads to, and it all just kind of unravels. What is remarkable, I'll say about the Orientals though, somehow they can start from a false principle and they haven't gone that far out. And it could be because there's, on the other flip side of things, their antiquarianism could actually be preserving them from. So, Almost everything else, they're identical to. And it would certainly be a lot easier to heal the schism between the Orientals and us Orthodox before Rome. That's why it's always so funny people from Rome. And it's like, it feels like that's coming from Rome. They would like it to happen. And they think it's. Oh, there's, there's there's, there's people in Orthodox that would want it to happen too. Really? They're called ecumenists, yeah. 
the ecumenical patriarchs particularly fawned on. And there's people in the United States that want that too. Now, why would they want that? Because they have prior presuppositions and mistakes that they make that lead them to actually say those things. They're affected by other ideas that aren't orthodox, sorts of relativism by various levels, perennialism. Right. Why am I also hung up on Jews, Christians, and Muslims don't worship the same God? Why is it clear? We're not talking about the same entity. This comes from natural theology, but if we all are, I mean, isn't it just kind of core in that everything, you have like this core, this generic God, right, that we can all talk about. And these things are just like decorations, right? And hey, look, the Muslims just get these, the Muslims and the Mormons, they got, they got the core right, and maybe even they got one or two things here, they just missed the rest of that. You can start to see if you already buy into this kind of natural theological uh, theology presupposition that you would probably end up becoming, if logically played out, an ecumenist. We're all just worshiping the same God. These are just kind of minor differences, right? It's like, no, we're not talking about the same entity at all. That's why I wrote that paper. I'm so big on that is... Because that mistake right there, that there's a core. Somebody asked me this question the other day in a stream. What do you mean by generic God? There's no such thing as a generic God. The same thing that I mean that there's no generic Batushka Catherine. Have you heard about just the bare core Matushka? It's... Basically, five foot six, female, and brown hair. That's it. It's a like, there is no such thing as five foot six, brown haired female. It's this five, six, brown haired female with all these other attributes. It's instantiated. There's always a this. There's no idea of the generic Matushka floating, right? I'm like, that's what I mean. <laughs> There's no generic God. It's an idea. What does Father Russell say? And Father Russell does agree with me on this one. It's a fantasy between your two ears. It's in your head, which is exactly why I say, both because of the denial of the divine energies, that God is eminently present here in the world, not in his essence, but his, his eternal uh, ener uh, activities and his energies, together with the fact that we don't have a natural theology, a generic God, that I argue that papists, whoops, <laughs> papists are, um, they're not worshiping God, they're worshiping an, a phantasm in their head. What happens to all their worship juice when they worship though? Where's that going? Well, God can do whatever he wants. Like, And there's two things that I wanna say. You know God, every man knows God, the Trinity, in their heart. Whether they can explain it as Trinity or not. John leapt in Elizabeth's womb for form concepts. And why? Because he knew God in his noose, in his heart of hearts. Every man does, every Muslim, every Jew, every pagan knows the Trinity. But intellect and words, those are different. And oftentimes that can cloud the noose, right? Once I come up with a particular conception, well, this is actually what God is. What typically happens? I end up listening to my own thoughts and worshiping my own thoughts about who God is rather than God himself who dwells in each and every man's heart. Now, God can work that out. That's above my pay grade of he knows every man's hearts. I'm saying the intellect 
philosophies and religions get in the way of true worship and true talk to God, even at the level of orthodoxy, right? What is the thing that's always getting in the way between us and God? Ourselves. Not other people. It's ourselves and our own thoughts. So if it's for us, imagine it's going to happen for everybody else, too. So we construct these philosophical systems and ideas. That's why in orthodoxy, what do we say with the noetic prayer? What are we doing? We're emptying the mind of logosmoy, words and thoughts. We're quieting so we can hear God, so we can see him and we can know him. Because your thoughts are getting in the way. Your thoughts can make you end up hitting something by where you're using the word God that's an, just like a non-existent generic matushka. It doesn't exist. It's in your head. It's a fantasy in your Does that make sense? Is that kind of a better way to put it? That's crazy because I remember learning in my Catholic high school about, you know, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and he's all about the imaginative imaginary prayer. prayer. And... That's why we don't do imaginary prayers, yeah. too. That's completely and imaginary prayers are even worse. You're not supposed to visualize when you pray. Do you not know that? Father Russell, I'm going to go through this with you. Thank God you guys are in catechesis. And you're not supposed to visualize. So I don't know if you explicitly told me that, but I, I sort of understand that you're, it's, it's very natural to you. That's why we have to actually have to state it. Don't visualize, but you still pray in like words, though, right? You so what you want to do, you want to start with words. Start with audible words. Um, and glory to thee, O oh God, glory to thee. Right. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Our Father who art in heaven. Okay, so we start with those. What I don't want to do is when I say that, our Father, then think of a father and walking through the clouds and stuff like that. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Now, you may actually even visualize the words, our Father, right? And that's not as bad as, I don't know if you do that when you think. Do you see words sometimes? In, sometimes it's kind of turned turn off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's not like a, the same thing as like visualizing and stuff like that, like Christ and the father and clouds and heaven and what, it, you know, temptation, lead me not into temptation, right? Or sound like, don't do that, right? That's the first step. Next step is like, you'll stop even visualizing words. You just say the words. What you want to do is you want to noetic prayer, Bring the head down into the heart. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. So it's, it's, That's why sometimes the, the Hatskis were actually known for putting their, sitting on their heads that like, almost the physical motion of Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. So, so the ultimate. That's sometimes why they even right. breathe, right? It's going down into. Right. So bring, just, just use your heart. Use the heart. So event and it's training too. The more that you do this, like when and I, sometimes you want to start the Jesus prayer. Like I typically do the Jesus prayer really intensely when I going to bed and I can't sleep. I'm like, might as well do the Jesus prayer, right? It's all dark. It's an amazing opportunity too, right? And at first I'll have all these pictures in my head of things going on that happen in the day. And then I'm just like this. And then I'm starting to see the words. And it's like, I'm just in the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I got mercy upon me. Slowing it down, slowing it down until there's nothing. Yeah, that's meditation. That's med it is meditation. Yeah. And I don't want to put it in a visual image because it's not, but I I almost feel like if here's the veil. Right? God's on the other side. I'm doing this. Moving all the obstacles. And then my heart is like this. Yeah. I am touching God like that. And he, there's no words. 
There's no visualizations. There's no thoughts anymore. So, and immediately something's going to be like, God's going to show me something. That's a thought. Put it out. Am I going to have some type of sensation and God's going to, no, put it out. Just quiet. And all it is is just a human presence. You don't need anything. You don't have to. And it takes me, it can take me, like I get better at the more I do, but that can take me 15 to 30 minutes to get that, just to clear all the crud out of my my head and tell them like, here I'm in. And then I, I can't hold it that long, to be honest. I can keep it there. And that's just because um, I'm not a saint. <laughs> I haven't mastered ascesis, yeah, but I totally. Know but I get better at it. Like, but I can hold it there for fifteen. And then all of a sudden, I'm my thoughts are back, and then or I go off into a dream or something like that. And I'm like, okay, but and God, God touched me and healed me. Like removed all the. That's what you want to do, and that's why we visualization. So if you think about this. Here's reality. You have thoughts about reality. They're not the same, are they? So this is um, once removed from reality. Then, typically with thoughts, you have pictures about the thought, about the reality, right? Um, and what's the word I want to use? It doesn't have to be pictures. It can be... Um, Imagination? Conception. Imagination. Imagination can be visualization. It can be auditory. Like, it could be... Imagination is twice removed from reality. And Plato talked about this. So the visualization. So I have a thought about a car. That doesn't really change much. Or now picture a car. Picture imagining. Is it hard to hold and get the details? It's kind of shifting. Right, you can close your eyes and actually do this. Picture your car with me right now. How how much details can you get? Can you hold? Can you focus in on the steering wheel? What's the size of it? Is it changing at all? Is it? Or is it? Do you see how it's very fluid? What about the color? Can you hone in on the color? Or is that kind of changing too? Is it, is it a little lighter shade or a darker shade? Do you see what I'm saying? No, I was thinking of my car and it's all pretty vivid. Okay. Is that what you meant? Or think is, it, it, is, it, is it that vivid? Yeah. If So you think that it would actually match a really? pic, if, if I pulled up a picture? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's What about the rest of you? And maybe I'm deficient. It's lacking in details for me. Yeah. No, I know every little details. every little detail of it. I can see the dust. Because yeah, you can focus on something like that, but I'm telling you, it's not the same thing as looking at your car. Yeah, but I mean, I, I obsess over like the dings that it does have and things like that. That's like, fine. You know, All right, think about this. Yeah. Think about a dream because you're in imagination land. Dream. That is an image and visualization. Now, but you know that you're dreaming because it's lacking in certain things, right? You can't see, and it, it tends to change. I'm telling you, the more you focus on, you'll start to see that it's, the size isn't. Now there's sometimes dreams are so real that you can't actually tell, which shows that most of the time our imaginations are extremely fluid and are not honed in. Otherwise, we wouldn't have those vivid dreams that were like, whoa, I, I almost can't tell the difference between that and reality. Right. 
So the fact of the matter is too, in philosophy, there's something called uh, cognitive contamination. And if I'm really good at my um, CIA training in psychological operations, psychological operations, psychological operations, is it? <laughs> I can apply an exception and I actually can change the way that you think or see your car. How many people have had this with memories? Right, and somebody's like, well, wait a minute, wasn't it actually like this? Didn't you leave the sock there? And it's like, now I can actually visualize leaving the sock over there. Well, did I? Because I have this other visualization that actually left it over there. Do you see how it can change? Why? Because it's twice removed from reality. Your thought of your car, though, because you were describing, you weren't describing the pictures, you're describing the idea of the dings and the size, right? I think this is what you're focusing on. That really doesn't change much. I might get stuff wrong. This will. This is much more easy, capable of manipulating. And why, why did Lenin, a master of propaganda, say we must seize cinema? The visual image is extremely powerful for then not only changing what your image is of reality, but your thoughts. Because you don't want it to go this way. You want things to go that way. So if you're focusing on imaginations and images, I can actually throw things in through visualization, right? And this is exactly what demons do. So if you're spending all your time out here, demons, just like propagandists, can pop up an image on a TV, in your mind, on a computer, and guess what? That'll eventually change the way that you think. Now thought becomes further removed from reality. So what we're supposed to do in prayer, knock it off, knock this off, first of all because it's twice removed from reality and it's much more prone to manipulation and propaganda, both by those in the world and those in the noetic realm. So we start here. And what we want to move to is eventually quiet this so that the Holy Spirit who is present everywhere and fills all things, who's present in reality. It's the present. I know it's kind of a new age sounding thing to uh, be present. What do they call that? Mindfulness, which is a call to present. But it's not, it's not a wrong principle. It's just in a wrong paradigm. Mindful by removing all the distractions and all that. Questions about that. These are great. I know it's a bit off topic, but great. Because we can't practically relate it to. Going back, let's tie it back to Craig's question. How does all this stuff, I mean, what if this is just high flute and philosophy and theology? What practical? Because if I don't get this right, I can't have... It impedes my contact and worship with God, right? That's another aspect of it. All right, any other questions about that before moving on? Or moving to... Okay, so going back to Chalcedon... They're not separated. It's not one nature from two natures either. One and the same son, only begotten word of God, the divine hypostasis is inseparable in a single hypostasis of the word. 
So that person, that single hypostasis, is the unifying principle of the two natures. And it does not change the person, the word. The Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ as to one person as the God, man. See that? Already in that form. One person as the God, man. It's fitting to give a single inseparable worship. Who do, it's not what do I worship, it's a who. Notice Moses asked for God's name on Mount Sinai. He said, I am who. I am a who. I'm a person. I am who am. I am truly person. And I'm entering into a personal relationship and I'm making because I made you in my image. Right? Worship is the person. And the person unites and brings us together through his hypostatic union. The decree of the fathers of the ecumenical council, the ninth canon gets heretics. If anyone shall take the expression of Christ ought to be worshipped in his two natures, in the sense that he wishes to introduce two adorations. Ooh, that's interesting. The one in a special relation to God, the word, and the other pertaining to man, and does not venerate by one adoration, God, the word, made man together with his flesh. The Holy Church was taught in the beginning to let him be anathema. Okay? So, inseparable. What's the principle of unity, of the inseparability of the two natures? The who? The person. Man change. Which leads us to an interesting Roman Catholic doctrine. The Latin cult of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Have you ever heard of seeing this? Yeah, so good. Did you guys find this is interesting? So let's put image up on the <laughs> Here it is. I always thought it was weird. When I was a kid. So strange. The first one's the no, that one too. Which one do you want? The, the one with the the spreading the lights. That's not so weird to me. Just the let's do this one. Pretty yeah, creepy. Pretty much that first one, yeah. Oh, it's a Wikipedia. It's even creepier. All right. So weird, man. Now that we set up what the various heresies are, why do Orthodox not accept the Roman Catholic Sacred Heart? In connection with this decree of the council, it may seem how in harmony with the, the spirit of practice of this church. Um, how, let's see, is the cult of the Sacred Heart of Jesus which has been introduced into Roman Catholic Church. Although the above side decree of the Fifth Ecumenical Council touches only on the separate worship of the divinity in humanity. So do you remember what I, re I read to you from the Fifth Ecumenical Council? You can't separate them in your worship. We worship He, who is the second person, the divine Logos, who unites the God-man, God-man, completely united. So I can't venerate the human nature and worship the divine. Why? They're completely united. They're distinct. They're not confused, but they're inseparable. And that means not only ontologically, i.e. the how it exists, how he exists with uh, the two natures in the personal subject of the divine word, but how we worship too. That's another thing when we have to ask that you like, how are you worshiping? It must be different. If Christ only has one nature, no longer two, 
They're fused, right? This becomes a tertium quid. That's just a fancy way for me to sound smarter than everybody else. No. Did I say that out loud? Yeah. Bad. That's okay. Bad. <laughs> Stop thinking. Talking out loud. What in Latin quid? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, quid, quote, quid, quote. Any, uh, the third thing, basically, a, a third thing is basically, here's one thing and here's one thing. So it gets me a new type of thing, a third thing. Just like this. Two hydrogens plus an oxygen gives you a third thing. That's neither one of these. And what is that? Water. 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 <laughs> so then that does make a difference in worship, doesn't it? We have a different worship. You're worshiping the third thing. You're worshiping water. No, you're worshiping whatever that you say. What happens... If I keep them separated in worship, well, you get something like this. Why? Because indirectly, the veneration, what does it say? And worship of Christ should be directed to him as a whole and not to parts of his being. But to one. Even if by heart we should understand the Savior's love itself, which is what you'll get. But like, oh, it's not literally you're worshiping his heart. It's his love. See his love shining out here? It's a creepy picture. That's the creepiest Jesus I've seen. His mustache is terrible. It's just like a creepy Jesus. No, Jamie and I found a creepier one before. Oh, it's pretty weird. They got one at Costco. <laughs> yeah, it's. I just don't like it. And why did they put the crown of thorns around his heart? It's so weird. Because he took on the crown of his love, right? Is embracing, is expressed through the pain. It's basically, and it's shining out to you, is basically the idea. But even if we were saying that, well, it just represents, we're not going to worship his body parts. It represents his love. We don't do that in orthodoxy. We don't separate. I worship the justice of God, the love of God, right? It's, we, we don't do that. We don't worship attributes of God. We worship the person the three persons of the Holy Trinity, right? So even that would be weird. And he says this, Father Pomazansky says, still as neither Old Testament nor in the New Testament was there ever custom to worship separately the love of God or his wisdom or his creative providence, provincial power or his sanctity. All the more must one say this concerning the parts of his bodily nature. There's something unnatural in the separation of the heart from the general body and nature of, and that unnaturalness and what's rubbing you wrong is what we know from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, heart scene. <laughs> I've seen this once before, no good. Where is it? Huh? You're right. It's the same. You got thing. the same vibe, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and that's because I'm a conspiracy theorist, is my student. <laughs> See how I connected all the dots? Who knew that we'd connect class to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? But there it is. It's exactly. A sacred heart worship cult. Um, 
Also connected to Guar concerts. Huh, interesting. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. I can just what is his name again? Kali Kama. Kali Ma. Yeah, Kali. Kali Ma. There. When theology goes wrong, theology can end nice. Okay. Um, something unnaturally says in the separation of the heart from the general body nature of the Lord. If it's an unnatural for humans, it's for a simple human being, then obviously even more for the God man, right? That's probably why it disturbs you. Even if it was not that, but a. How do I get. <laughs> Sacred on that. Other images that aren't as bad. They're all pretty bad. That one's probably not as bad. That looks almost normal, but not. It's trying to imitate Orthodox iconography. It's ugly. It's ugly. By. <clears throat> Oh, and they do the same thing for Mary as well. Yeah, notice that we talked about that. Uh, the book talks about that too. Mm -hmm. Or you could have a statue. What if in the future there's a sacred worship of Christ's intelligence or missions and you show him with a brain or something like that? Yeah, like that's what's going to happen. We're all just going to become set worshipers of reason and we're like, well, we, we worship his brain. What's up with the dual tough beard they keep doing on these Jesuses? I don't know. It's weird. I don't know where that. A lot of them Although happen. when I first started growing my beard, I don't know what happened. It started to actually grow out into the chin. Oh, let's say it can't be done. It's just weird how consistent it Why? is. Why? Yeah, where that tradition. <clears throat> Even in the ordinary relationship life, no matter how much a man might be attached to another, for example, mother or child, he would never refer to his attachment to the heart of, of the beloved person, but refer to as, yeah, imagine if- yeah, like, what if you're talking about your wife like that? Yeah, just, it, it'd be weird, my mom or- My wife. <clears throat> All right, any questions about that? So I found that was kind of interesting. I was even tempted, I was so impressed by the small little paragraph here. I almost wanted to put it on Facebook, but then I knew the papers would be like, no, what? Actually, no, it means this. No. You should do it just to see like their best response. I get with that a lot more on Twitter. Maybe I should do it. But I can I mean, a heart is something of this world. It's it, it has no place. Well, we want to say he had a heart. Right, we want to say the whole like we want to affirm everything humanity. Be, we don't want to separate it out though, right? Any more than I would be like we worship his wisdom, or and then when you do when you do that to the body itself, just even the statues or painting, it's unnatural. It's unnatural, right? It's disturbing. It's just weird. Yeah, we ate hearts last night for dinner. Oh. It, 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 it's not. You say Kali Mama as you did it? <laughs> <laughs> um, like Aztec uh, rituals, where they rip out the heart and they put the body down the temple. Oh, I didn't even have this on the share, did I? Yeah, it says your screen share. Now it does, but I think. But you were screenshot. I thought so. You were. I saw the thing. Um, now let's talk about the dogmas, i.e., teachings of the Orthodox Church concerning the Most Holy Mother of God. Her name's Theotokos. Two names Ever Virgin Theotokos. What do I always do? Call into remembrance our most blessed, glorious. Am I filling the blank? Calling into remembrance, most blessed, glorious. Ever virgin. Is that the one you Ever said? virgin. Yeah. 
the mother of our God, Theotokos, together with all the saints, most holy, most blessed and glorious, Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary is together with all the saints. So those are all her titles. That's how I refer to her. And they proceed immediately from the dogma of the unity of the hypostasis of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, um, from the moment of his incarnation. Okay, we give the different citations. She was, he was born of a virgin. He was conceived without seed. We were all conceived from seed. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit instead of not to be crude insemination. Um, which is exactly what we read in the creed. Came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overcame Theotokos and the Virgin Mary. It says, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. The ever virginity. We say ever virgin. Some people don't say that. Who is it? Francis. Yeah. Now, why are they so insistent in denying that? Have you ever wondered just psychologically? Yeah, what? Yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are. I think a lot of times they don't want Mary to be special, that she's just like the rest of us. Yeah, that's... Um, but it expressed the height of her chosenness. Luke, who that mean like that? There's a ghost. My soul doth magnify the Lord, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done great things, and holy is his name. That is pretty special. All generations forever will call you blessed. Blessed. Most holy, most blessed. Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary. So I think you're right. They want to reduce her to. In the same way. That blasphemers and pagans want to introduce that Christ was married. He was just like one of us, right? Now with Mary, she was just like one of us. And we'll talk about, because we deny the Immaculate Conception. But she's the highest of us. She's not like her. First of all, no one ever bore God. They, I've heard Protestant speakers, but she was just a vessel. She was chosen among all women because of her purity and because she was special. Right? They make it seem like God's like, oh, shoot. I have to choose somebody. Some period in time, might as well pick Mary. She's, you know, it's, the, it's just a vessel. That's the way they speak about her. Now, in part, they might be responding because of Roman Catholics kind of elevation of her to a tertium quid by saying she's the only one that didn't have uh, the, the stain of original sin. She was conceived immaculate from original sin, which makes her different than us. But she's not different than us. In that sense, she's same nature, same fallen nature. She was just full of grace and said yes to God, and God knew that. And she came from a particularly pious line of 
genetic line, right? There's something special. And God, remember what I said, each and every one of us are so uniquely loved that God foreordained from the, he says he knew you from the foundations of the earth and putting, if there was, we know that if your parents weren't your parents, you wouldn't be you, but you wouldn't be you unless your parents conceived in the particular moment that they did. If anything was different, that would affected even the conception such that you start to see how just integrated this whole thing is. Everything is here for you. God knew that and putting everything together, he had you in mind. That he preordained each molecule and part from the very beginning with you in mind, such that if anything was different, it wouldn't be a you. It would be somebody else. Now, if he did that for you, he did that for Mary, knowing how special she was. So she is special. Now, the archangel and the inspired words of Elizabeth when she visited Mary, and whence is it to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So this is showing that she's obviously has a special status. Uh, moving on. When the heretics and simple blasphemers refused to acknowledge the ever, this is great. I'll just call it as it is, right, Father? Father Pomazansky. When the heretics and simple blasphemers refused to acknowledge the ever virginity of the mother of God on the grounds that the evangelist mentions the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Have you heard this argument? Well, scripture says Jesus had brothers and sisters. They are refuted by the following facts in the gospel. A, in the gospels, there are named four brothers, James, um, Joseph, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. There are also mentioned the sisters of Jesus, no fewer than three, as is evident in the words, and his sisters, are they all not with us? <laughs> On the other hand, and they count to the journey in Jerusalem. Now, this is an argument that I hadn't heard before, and I think it's good. And we'll talk about other arguments, too. With the 12-year-old Christ, where there is a mention of kinsfolks and acquaintances in the midst of whom they were seeking Jesus, and where it is mentioned that Mary and Joseph every year journeyed from far away Galilee to Jerusalem, no reason is given to think that they were present, that there were present other younger children with Mary. It was thus that the first 12 years of the Lord's earthly life proceeded. See, when about 20 years after the above mentioned journey, Mary stood on the cross of the Lord's she was alone, and she was entrusted by her divine son and to his disciple John. From that hour, the disciple took her unto his home. Evidently, as ancient Christians also understood, the evangelists speak of either half-brothers, sisters, or cousins. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to understand what the, the previous arguments are. I understand, I understand C. So what's the one in the account to Jerusalem where there's the mention of kinfolks and acquaintances? Kinfolk. In the midst of whom they were seeking Jesus and were likely mentioned. Oh, there's no children present. So is Father Pomazansky saying, if you had brothers and sisters, and it mentioned his kinfolks and acquaintances. Where were they? I think that's what he's saying. They didn't include siblings. 
Well, the siblings, there's no children mentioned. And if he had literal brothers and sisters, they would have been present there, but there were no children present there. Just kinsfolks and acquaintances. I think that's it. Um, Because he has named brothers James, Joas, Simon, Jude, and sisters, no fewer than three. Um, do you see the argument that he's making? So there's, there's, all of those are considered his brothers and sisters, okay? Um, so they should be children along with him. At least some of them, if there's four and three at least that are called that. But if it says his kin folks and acquaintances were with him when he was 12 on his journey to Jerusalem, why weren't any children present? I think that's his argument. Um, okay. But the word, I looked this up. There you go. Straight from Edinburgh. Straight from the streets of Edinburgh. <laughs> It can mean either biological brothers male siblings in a family but also people that were not of biological relations cousins family maybe even even extend to Um, there is a tradition, notice here, whether born to the same two parents or only one of the same father or the same mother. So we do know Joseph was quite older. And I think some people have actually been able to do, um, have been able to calculate the age of Mary and Joseph. Do you know the age discrepancy? What was it? More than 20 years, wasn't it? Yeah, it's really normal for forever. So she was 14, 76. 76? Have you ever wondered why he's not mentioned later in the... Well, I figured he died. I didn't know he was that old. That's I think old. that's... Look, uh, let's, let's look this up real quick. So we had previous marriages. He was... Uh, I think the tradition is his wife had died, he was married, and he had kids, and um, he took on, he, he betrothed Mary, he took her on as her protector, which would make sense why they didn't have sexual relations. There's other things that are involved in that too, why he why he wouldn't have. But he was assigned as her protector because what happens to a woman in that time if they don't have a husband and they're pregnant or they're horse? Stoned. Yeah, they're excluded from society. So he had to he had to take her on as of uh, Mary and Joseph. Anyways, you had a question, go. I think that's gonna provide the go ahead, you you were the 
This one says 12 to 16. Why just put age of said you live to be 110? This Which is means? a different oh, okay. I know I should put Joseph. I'm so bad at doing these. It looked like you had an answer on the top of the last one. Joseph didn't marry Mary until he was 80 years old, so is that Christianity bad? Where? The cycle is on. So you get a rough idea. Um, I found an article on this. Um, before that it actually kind of explained really well about how they calculated the ages. And but you see they're all roughly around the same. I think the Orthodox tradition is she was 14, he was 76. It doesn't look like there's much consensus on this though. I'm seeing ages from he was 36 to 42. To oh, from Orthodoxy? No, from yeah, what was. That's exactly why you don't go. But there. I mean, is worse than Orthodox answer. Um, I've found it before. I don't know why I can't. That's your homework. Find. There's a great article from it. I don't know where. Where it explains how they actually calculated that. Um, anyways, why did I bring that up? Oh, well, it had something to do with their the siblings. Um, there were probably half brothers and half sisters. If if that was actually true, um, <clears throat> Joseph had children from a previous marriage, then they would be called the brothers. And that would also make sense of why there were no children present and they're much older, but they could still be called brothers. But that wouldn't make sense in the time frame of if Joseph um, had intercourse with um, married and produced children, they would have been children closer to they would have been close to Christ's age. So it wasn't that much time, right? The subscribe between that from when he was 12, so therefore they would have been children, but there was no children mentioned. So uh, th these are all, there's other arguments too. We call her Theotokos. We talked about that. Because we can't separate the nature. She, they were united in the incarnation. Um, the name Theotokos has a direct foundation in scripture. St. Paul says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. Here's expressed the truth that woman gave birth to the son of God. B, God was manifest in the flesh. Um, but I want to move to this. Well, we know this one. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and spake out in a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord come to me and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told from her to the Lord. <clears throat> so Theotokos, the virgin birth. This is also the prophecy from Ezekiel that um, we know that she's ever virgin. Uh, Ezekiel 44.2 says, 
Then said the Lord unto me, the gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. That's pretty clear to me. Um, Prophet Isaiah, prophet, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel, which is say, God is with us, for unto a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Messenger, Great Counsel, Wonderful. Okay, so on and so on. Um, Saint Ignatius, the God bearer, Saint Athanasius, um, say, Our God, Jesus Christ, was in the womb of Mary, God took flesh, right? All of this is to back up Theotokos. Um, okay, let's go to the next section. The proclamation by the Roman Church of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Now, you've heard that before. You ever wondered what that means, Immaculate Conception? And bodily assumption of the Mother of God. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception was proclaimed by a papal bull of Pope Pius IX in 1854. The definition of this dogma says that the Most High Virgin Mary, at the moment of her conception, was cleansed from original sin. In essence, this is a direct deduction from the Roman teaching on original sin. According to the Roman teaching, the burden of the sin of our first ancestors consists in the removal from mankind of the supernatural gift of grace. Does everybody understand that? So, there's a couple things with original sin. The Augustine kind of Latin version of original sin. The original sin of Adam and Eve, you're cursed for. Legally. Sorry, that's... So it's not that if my parents had the sin of drug and alcohol abuse that it might affect me and I might have fetal alcohol syndrome or prone to addiction. But imagine, imagine this. Imagine if my parents were long gone and this judge that just this injunction here and surprise from Missoula, right? He was like, well, we're locking you up. Why? Well, because your parents did illegal substances. <laughs> well, how do you know that? Okay, just look how look how messed up your face looks, right? You obviously have a feel. I'm like, why? That's not very nice. And because you got a messed up face, I made the logical juridical deduction that you're obviously guilty for your parents' sin. And uh, well, we can't try them because they're gone, so we're we're putting you in jail. Would that be right? That's a, basically an analogy for what original sin is. Not only do we have a messed up face, I mean, soul, um, we stand guilty. And part of the guilt is that we receive the graces removed from us. That's why Augustine says you must be baptized. Now, we say baptism for the remission of sins. He understands something very different. That the grace that was removed will be then reapplied. The lost the paradise lost will be paradise restored because you're absent of. So Augustine on nature and grace and other places, what happens if you die and you're not baptized? Go to hell. Well, what if it's you, you get your baby? Baptized yet? It's not 40 days. They go to hell. And I remember it was so crazy. This guy was a real jerk in class, but he was kind of an intellectual bully. And I remember we we're reading through Augustine, and they're all Roman Catholic, right? So it's like, we've got to accept this as our doctrine. And this girl started crying. 
She was like, I just can't accept that all the aborted babies are going to hell. And one of them's like, face it. They're burning in hell. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'm like, I just never be going around Catholic. <laughs> and stop crying. I was like, take it easy, dude. Can you imagine seeing that in school? Our school is like hardcore, like that's psychotic, yeah. That's wild. It's the facts, it's just theology, and you're gonna have to like don't they teach different now? Don't they have some little caveat for aborted babies now in the Catholic Church? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they changed it. That's the great thing about papers. They're good at changing. You can make infallible on changing statements yeah. and change them later and then pretend that that never happened. Yeah. Um, okay, everybody understand that with the original sin, and I'll wrap up pretty soon, but this is a good section that. Um, bu- 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 so when we. Re- when the archangel addresses Mary, rejoice, thou art full of grace. So notice the prior misconceptions and presuppositions uh, that go back to original sin. I have no grace. Then if you're conceived, right? And well, if Archangel Gabriel visiting said, Hail Mary, full of grace. What do you think how they're going to interpret that line? She's not like us. If she has full of grace, and there's no baptism yet, first of all, I don't even know what they say about all the patriarchs, like the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Like, are they all burning in hell too? Because I don't know if they have a herring of Hades. I don't think they do. Doctrine. Maybe some Catholics are like, oh, he went and preached to you and put his grace. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. They have something like it. It's even in that Passion of the Christ movie. So they can only conclude that the most holy Virgin Mary had been removed from the general law of the deprivation of grace and the guilt of the sin of Adam. That's where the doctrine of immaculate conception, she, Holy Mary, Mother of God, was conceived in a unique way that's never been seen before. Without the removal of grace, she was conceived in the fullness of grace. She had the fullness of grace, and she did not have the guilt of original sin on her. So... Although they might agree with us that Mary never sinned in action, we would say for a very different reason. They would say she never sinned. She sinned this because she was conceived immaculately. She was full of grace and didn't have, she was restored the moment she was born. Do you understand that? And so in 1950, the so-called Jubilee year, uh, Roman Pope Pius XII, emphatically proclaimed a second dogma, the dogma, the assumption of the mother of God with her body into heaven. Now, in the new calendar, this is celebrating my birthday. The door, We call it the Dormition. Um, on the old calendar, it's, what, 13 days dif- different? Um, they call August 15th the assumption. Dormition means what? The falling asleep. She died. They reject and deny that she died. They said, no, she assumed in the heaven without death. Why would they say that? One mistake, original sin, doctrine, leads to a second mistake. What is that? Oh, she didn't have original sin. She couldn't die. Yes. Leads to a third one. Now, that's really interesting. I've heard, now what's really weird, and this is why Jay and I always say that uh, unitism disproves the papacy, Byzantine Catholics. They, Roman Catholics allow the uh, Byzantine 
uh, Catholics to celebrate the Dormition, that she died. But this excludes that she can die. These two things right there. But those aren't just normal magisterium, ordinary magisterium, which you'd still have to follow. Those are defined as what? They're, yeah, and they're ex cathedra. They're extraordinary magisterium. If you allow the Dormition and the Assumption, you're obviously false. That's impossible. Those are two mutually exclusive. But do you see it doesn't matter as long as you're kissing the ring of the Pope? Does it really matter what you believe? Why do you think the Quran's being read in the Vatican? Yeah, Does it really matter? Why is he building, consecrating Mormon temples? So well, as long as you just pay allegiance to you. you want to believe in whatever doctrine you want? We're all talking about the same God, aren't we? I mean, aren't these just kind of minor differences? Can we just um... do you see how it kind of plays out? Oh, yeah. Seems good enough. The declaration of both dogmas corresponds to the Roman Catholic theory of development of dogmas. If you ever read uh, Cardinal Henry Newman's uh, work on the development, his essays on the development of uh, Christian doctrine, where this is developed, that which is different than those, we would say we clarify what was always believed and held. They would say we can develop it. And he uses a seed analogy. Well, it can grow. Doctrine's kind of like a seed, right? And it can become something more. It can develop. And that's why we can change these things and basically clarify. Well, they don't really go to hell. It's limbo. Um, that's the way it looked like in a seed form. But you see, a seed can grow into you. Isn't that a nice analogy? I'm going to use that when I'm in court. Well, you see, the... I mean, it's not really how, I mean, I, I could obviously see how you can think that maybe that, but really if with my doctrine of justice development, um, we now know that that's not exactly what happened, right, Your Honor? <laughs> oh, sir. Amazing sophistry. I don't think it would work for me. But then again, I'm not a pope. The Orthodox Church does not accept the last Latin systems <clears throat> of arguments concerning original sin. <clears throat> In particular, the Orthodox Church, listen to this, <clears throat> and we'll end right after this because it's one minute. The Orthodox Church confessing the perfect personal immaculateness and perfect sanctity, the mother of God. So do you see, we do confess that. Personally, she did not make take any actions that were considered sins. She lived and acted in her will holy, her sanctity. whom the Lord Jesus Christ by birth from her made her to become more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defile, make a birth to God the Word. To the Atokos be magnified. Has not seen, nor does it see, any grounds for the establishment of doctrine of immaculate conception. So that's out. <clears throat> In the sense of Roman Catholic interpretation. Although it does venerate the conception of the Mother of God, as it does the conception of the Holy Prophet and Forerunner. Okay. Um, and then it just goes on to talk about the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs, the pure and immaculate life of the Virgin Mary, up to the Annunciation uh, by the Archangel, blah, blah, blah. Any questions about that? And that takes us up to the next section that I wanted to, 197.
Oh, this is good. One must acknowledge the very principle of preliminary privilege is somehow not in harmony with the Christian concepts, for there is no respecter of uh, persons with God. So she's one of us, right? But her actions are the par excellence. If Christ said, go sing no more, it's possible. Mm -hmm. With his help, it's possible. And she's an example. So is um, tradition, the Orthodox tradition holds St. John the Baptist as well, which is the second saint to marry. I don't know if you know that. It goes St. Mary, St. John the Baptist. Okay, any questions about that? Right. Let's pray and then heart and the wild liturgy tomorrow. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We us not into temptation, but the deliverance from the evil in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Now that the evening has come to a close, we ask, now that the day has come to a close, we ask that the evening with the night may be sinless. Grant this to us, O Savior, and save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now that the day has come to a close, we ask that the evening with the night may be without offense. Grant this to us, O Savior, and Savior, and save us. Both now and ever into the ages of ages, amen. If we've sinned, whether in thought, word, or deed, forgive us, Lord, for thou lovest mankind and wishest us nothing to perish. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us through your life giving, holy, precious, life giving, holy cross, amen. amen.